Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It looks like there is just a couple of us, so we are going to pivot just a little bit. Um, but first, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ashlyn, and I'm the Assistant Director for Events and Volunteer Management for Grand Valley's Alumni Relations Office. Um, tonight's workshop is the fourth installation of our Career Readiness Series. With the support of fellow GBSU alumni and community leaders, we're able to offer you in-depth career support that is specifically catered towards our recent graduates and Grand Valley alumni searching for a postgraduate career. I will hand it over shortly to our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, originally, this is where I was going to share a brief outline of tonight's program, but it looks like there are only three of you joining us tonight. Um, so our presenters have indicated that they would be comfortable having a more conversational style and less formalized event. Um, is that something you would all be comfortable with? Oh, it looks like you're still good, Julie. Jenna and Shane, is that something you would be comfortable with? Yep, that's good with me. Great. Well, then with that, um, I have some questions here I'm happy to ask, or if you have any questions, um, you can ask them as well. But I will go ahead and introduce um, Rachel Gray and Nate. I'm sorry, how do you say your last name? Nate Axdorf. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Good. I'll remember that. I should have asked that earlier. Um, so with that, Rachel, if you would like to share a little bit about yourself and your career history and um, your background that led you here as a panelist tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ashlyn. Uh, good evening, everyone. Great to be with you tonight. Uh, my name is Rachel Gray, and I'm the executive director of Hello West Michigan. So our organization is a nonprofit who helps people who want to relocate here. Uh, so my guess is if you are current students um, and you're currently here in Michigan at Grand Valley um, and you're on this panel, my guess is you're probably not going to be utilizing my services. You're going to want to utilize services of organizations like mine. And that's A-OK. -okay. Um, we, we always want to help folks uh, make the right decision. Um, and so kind of one of the reasons Ashlyn asked me here tonight um, was, you know, thinking about what I do, are there things that I do to help um, people who want to relocate here? Can I take that knowledge and help you? So basically what we do is we help people who want to relocate to West Michigan. Um, we work with, uh, with employers um, who want to recruit those folks as well. So it's this really kind of fun mix of both promoting the region, working with job seekers, and then also working with companies in HR. Um, basically, it's my job to learn about all the great things that there are to do in West Michigan, to go experience them, and then talk about them to people. So um, that's a little bit about what I do at Hello West Michigan. Uh, my path to the organization was, was pretty interesting. Nate and I were actually chatting a little bit about some of our shared history um, before we got on tonight's call. It turns out we actually know each other and have met before um, and, uh, and, and kind of reminded each other because um, I used to work in career services as a student. So um, for, uh, for those of you on campus, uh, tomorrow is the career fair at Grand Valley. Um, probably a lot of people are not going to go because it's it's snowy and crappy out, um, but I really encourage you to go. That's where I used to work, um, and that's how I found my job at Hello West Michigan. So you definitely want to make friends with the folks at Career Services. I know Nate's going to tell you the same thing, um, but uh, but definitely make the, use of your, uh, make the most of the tools that you have, and uh, I know you're doing that because you're logged on tonight. So, Ashlyn? Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Nate, would you like to share a bit about your career, I'm sorry, career history and what brought you here tonight? Sure, absolutely. So hi everyone, I'm Nate Axdorf, currently the Associate Director of Student Employment at DePaul University. So uh, I'm a Laker for a lifetime, though I work for a different institution now. Um, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, went to Granville Public Schools, Hope College for my undergrad, and then Grand Valley for my master's degree in higher education. Um, I worked at Grand Valley for two years in their career center, had an absolutely wonderful time, loved it, uh, and then went on to work for Grand Rapids Community College for a year. And then I decided to go into the Peace Corps. I left uh, the country and I worked in Ecuador for two and a half years. I was a secondary English teacher uh, teaching in an inner city high school. Uh, and then I came back, I moved up to Houghton, Michigan, and I lived, uh, or I, I worked at Michigan Tech uh, University up in Houghton, Michigan. Um, so I was really far north, about as far north as you can get in Michigan, up in the Keweenaw uh, Peninsula, 
Uh, and then in 2021, uh, mid-pandemic, I made a big switch and moved from Houghton all the way to Chicago. And uh, so I moved about six and a half hours south, and uh, I'm now working at DePaul. I've been here for about two years, and um, I, I've done a lot of relocating, so I would be very happy to share uh, what I've gone through and what tips I have for all of you. Absolutely. I bet you have great advice. You've relocated to areas that are quite different from each other. So <laughs> there's a wide spectrum of experiences there, um, I'm sure. So Julie, Jenna, and Shane, I would invite you to unmute yourselves and or start your video if you're comfortable. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that we can all see one another. Um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and kind of what brought you here tonight, um, and then we can start our conversation around re relocation. I can go first. Um, I'm Jenna. I'm graduating this spring. I'm a mechanical engineering. Uh, major. So the weird thing for me is I, I walk with everyone in the spring, but I not done till after summer. So that's like a little weird position for me, especially when I'm like looking for out of state jobs is it's hard. Like everyone in Grand Rapids knows. So like if I was looking for a job here, they'd all be ready to start me in the September. But like looking out of state, it's like I don't want to apply yet, but I feel like I, I'm behind almost. But it seems really early for out of state. So I don't know. I was just like, looking for some information for applying to jobs and yeah. Oh, thank you so much for being here, especially on a day campus is remote. It's perfect. <laughs> Shane, would you like to, hey. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Would you like to share a little bit yeah. about uh, what brought you here tonight? Yeah, um, this, this device doesn't have a camera by the way. Oh, that's um, okay. Well, I'm a senior at GVSU, so uh, the task is coming up pretty fast. Uh, I am going to the the event tomorrow. Um, which which installment was this? This which, was which one is this about? Four that's, out of five. About, <laughs> Relocation yeah. on this one, yeah. This is which. Um, so, what's it about? This um, segment is about relocation. Okay, so relocation if you want to find a job somewhere out of Michigan? Yep, if you find an yeah. out-of-area okay. position or, um, yes, or if you're interested in an out-of-area position, just um, resources that are available to you and how to navigate that move. Okay. Thank you for being here. And Julie? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm Shane's mom. Um, I'm just kind of here and helping him kind of navigate the work world a little bit. Um, so yeah, he's graduating uh, this April. Um, and again, you know, my husband and I are actually, he's getting ready to retire. And so we're, he's always wanted to go back out West. Um, that's where he used to live. So you know, we're contemplating that a little bit and we're kind of hoping <laughs> Shane will <laughs> go somewhere <laughs> and we'll follow him. But, um, you know, I may be needing to find a job myself uh, relocating. So it's kind of we're killing two birds with one stone here. So. Oh, well, awesome. Well, thank you for being here tonight. I know I've seen both you and Shane in a couple of our um, programs. So we appreciate you attending and hope that they've been beneficial to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a few questions prepared that I'm happy to get started. Or if anybody has specific questions they would like to start with, um, you can absolutely feel free. Um, I'm sure there will be be time for all of those things. So um, feel free to interrupt me or Rachel or Nate at any time um, with any of those burning questions. Um, as we start, let's chat a bit about um, if there's any tips and advice that you can offer around the application process when applying for an out-of-state position. Um, some applications state, if you're specifically looking for a position out of state, some applications state that you must have a valid driver's license. So does this exclude you from applying to those positions? Um, conversely, I personally have heard you some, 
like it's recommended you leave your address off your resume and then do an explanation in a cover letter. Is there any tips or guidance around that that you could expand upon a little? Nate, you want to go first? You want me to go? It doesn't matter to me. If you want to take it away, Rachel, I'll, I'll fill in the gaps. <laughs> sure. So, um, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, you know, when you think about relocation, you think about companies, um, typically companies are going to have budget for um, relocating a candidate when it's a higher level position or when, um, when it's a harder to fill position. So like if they know they have to source candidates from outside of the area, that's typically when they're going to have budget for relocation. Um, so if you don't think you fall into one of those two categories, um, then that's when I would say, you know, maybe think about if you're going to self fund a relocation, um, and you say, I'm going to this place, whether, you know, whether I get actively recruited or not, then that's maybe when you want to take, take off your, your Michigan address. Um, you know, if you're saying, okay, I'm going to go to this place, whether they recruit me here or not. Then I think, you know, that's when you're saying, all right, I have the money to do this. I have the money to self-fund this. Um, so they don't necessarily need to know where I'm coming from. Um, if you work in a field or have enough experience that you think that um, they might pay you to relocate there, I think it's perfectly okay to put your, your address on. Um, the other thing is you can also A-B test it, right? Like you can apply and have your address on and, and see, you know, are you getting calls back, you know, callbacks or not? And if not, then try taking it off. Um, the other thing is if you're moving to a place um, that you know someone, like you already know someone in that place, um, you know, especially like a family member, uh, you can always use their address. Um, that's actually something that uh, a lot of, um, I work with a lot of potential boomerang. So people who have lived here in Michigan um, and have left and want to come back, um, a lot of times they will use their parents' address or a friend's address um, because again, they're coming anyways. And so by saying like, hey, I'm coming anyways, I have a local address there, even if it's not your address yet. Um, that's, that's usually okay. Um, and for a, a, a license, um, that's really more about driving. Um, that's not so much about like a valid license in that state. So that's, that's kind of what I was thinking about that one. Nate, what, what else do you think? Yeah. So I would say as far as the license piece, I totally agree. Um, in my notes, when I was preparing for this, I wrote, if you're required to drive for the position, um, and you would need a license then, but they're not saying you necessarily need a license for that state you're moving to, unless it clearly indicates that and there's a reason being for that. So I would never look at a, a piece that talks about the license as a requirement and think, oh, I need like an Illinois license or else I can't work at this company. So don't worry about that. Totally agree with the pieces that Rachel mentioned um, as far as address goes. If it makes sense to put someone's address uh, in the state that you're moving to, or want to move to, then utilize that to your advantage. I think another big thing is utilize a network. And networking can be kind of a scary word for some people or a buzzword, but it's really all about building community. You know, you're creating connections between people. Uh, so let's say there's a network of Grand Valley alumni out in uh, Oregon, and you really want to go work there connect with those folks. And if you're not sure how, there's many different resources, uh, many of them being through Grand Valley, but also uh, there's LinkedIn, which is a great website. Uh, a lot of people don't always uh, utilize LinkedIn to the best of its ability. I actually got my job at DePaul through LinkedIn. I stumbled across a Grand Valley alumna who was married to the vice president of um, one of the colleges at DePaul. And uh, I just, wrote her a message and I said, would you mind chatting with me? And she said, sure. And after we got done talking, she said, you know, I'm going to tell my husband to give you a letter of recommendation for a job at DePaul. And that's how I got the position here. So um, really, really recommend just connecting with people. Uh, people want to help each other. So util utilize those uh, platforms like LinkedIn um, at Grand Valley. I'm sure there's wonderful resources. Um, I know there were when I used to be there. Uh, that you can utilize. Just go into the Career Center, chat with them. For example, the Career Fair tomorrow, there might be less people going because of the weather. So make sure you go and then you have everyone's attention at the fair. Uh, and just talk to everybody, just chit chat. I remember when I was uh, in, in college, I would always chat with the Peace Corps recruiters thinking, I don't know if I'll ever do Peace Corps. Later on, 2017 to 2019, I was in the Peace Corps in Ecuador, and I'm so glad I chatted with each of those recruiters because they actually were references uh, for me to go abroad and, and 
teach and work there. Um, so one of my biggest recommendations is start just start talking with people, start asking questions, uh, find people within your own life. So family, friends, uh, maybe your friend's parents, uh, friends of friends, et cetera. Just start chatting with them and see uh, where that leads to. Um, I was interested in potentially working for Frederick Meyer Gardens, which all of you might be familiar with. Uh, and I wanted to utilize uh, my master's of education and potentially do adult ed there. Uh, but unfortunately the pandemic happened and so they didn't really need anyone in that role. So I just chatted with the director and we had a wonderful conversation. She was very upfront that she didn't have anything available, but a, a really good question I had at the end was, is there anybody else you know that I should talk to? And then she connected me with several more people down the line and I eventually uh, decided to, to come to DePaul anyway. Uh, but I had a, a whole network of people I was talking with and just having really good conversation with. So when you're applying out of state, I really recommend, and even out of Grand Rapids, I really recommend just creating those uh, conversations with people, communicate with different folks, and uh, just start chatting with your professors or your friends, see where they're from. Maybe they're from a state that uh, you've never considered or that you do want to move to. Uh, and, and that's a, a great way to just start the process. Thank you so much. A lot of interesting things I have heard before um, that both of you brought up and questions that sparked. Um, both you, Nate, and Rachel touched on the importance of networks, which I'm sure to all of us here is no, uh, right, that's a buzzword. We hear it a lot and we know how important, especially in career search networks are. Apart from building LinkedIn, um, you know, meeting people face to face and kind of giving them uh, maybe an elevator pitch or a bit about you and just making that personal connection. Do you have any advice um, for how to build, build your network in an area you're either heading or know you're going or interested in going, um, et cetera? <laughs> well, start with, with where you might know people, right? Like if you're thinking about going somewhere and so, you know, Julie, you mentioned out West, is there somewhere out West that you have connections? Um, it is a lot easier to move to a place where you know, where you know somebody, even if it's just one person. Um, you know, if you have it in your mind of like, hey, I, you know, this city, like I hear cool things about this city. I hear, you know, it's a great place to live and work. Then it's time to do your research, right? Like if you have an idea of someplace but you don't necessarily have people there, it's time to, to get researching. Nate already mentioned like a great place to start. So if, if you find a place uh, that, you, that you think you might want to go, that you don't have anyone there, the first place to go is LinkedIn and try to collect, connect with another alum, right? If you don't have family or friends there, that's your next best, like closest connection you can do. And you can do it without actually physically going there, right? Like that's one of the, the beauties of, um, of kind of this virtual world that we're in um, is you can do that. Uh, and so that's like a number one of how you how you start building your network there is, is start building it digitally. The other thing is, um, you know, depending on where you're going, as you're doing research about that community, see if there's an organization like Hello West Michigan that can help you. Um, we're really unique in that we were actually the first organization of our kind in the country. So that means we used to be the one and only. But now I have about 50. Now they're they're competitors to me, but they may be helpful to you. Um, and they are all over the United States. Um, it could be for a whole state. It could be for a region. Um, a lot of larger cities have have one for kind of like the metro area. Um, they're all called different things. Um, so like mine is Hello West Michigan. There is literally one called Hello Cincy. So kind of like the same format. Um, but you know, others might have different names and you have to find those. Those are the people, they do what I do, but for that town. And so they can be really helpful as well um, and a really good place to connect with. Um, but I will tell you, if you know if you're thinking, I want to go to Denver, Austin, or Los Angeles, or Seattle, a lot of we call those tier one cities, cities that have a million people or more in their metro area. Um, those cities do not necessarily have a Hello West Michigan um, or an organization like ours because people already want to move there based on that city's brand, um, and so they don't have to like get people to move there. Um, and so in those big cities, you're less likely to find. You're less likely to find an organization like mine, but you're still very likely to find something like another Grand Valley alum. 
Absolutely. Or what sparked my mind in that, and it's my career background, is a chamber of commerce, right? Or a experienced downtown group that can at least give you a little feel of the businesses in that area or industry, et cetera. Um, Rachel, just can you expand a little more if you're moving to another town and you are looking for an organization like Hello West Michigan, what is something you could search for to find that? Or are there any other you know, in your Google search, what do you recommend looking for? Yeah, so. Um, By What's the way, that? so what do you call, um, what is the type of organization? What is it called? Like Hello West Michigan. Yeah, so we, we'd be called a talent up? attraction and retention organization. So talent attraction would be what you'd be looking for. Um, also a destination marketing organization is another way that we're referred to. Um, Typically where you're going to find us, sometimes we're independent organizations like Hello West Michigan. Other times you'll find efforts or um, initiatives or programs are um, housed under something like a chamber of commerce, an economic developer, uh, sometimes the convention and visitors bureau. So like we have experienced Grand Rapids, that's um, basically like the visitors group for West Michigan um, and for Grand Rapids. Sometimes they're housed, you know, co-housed there. Um, another place could also be like mm -hmm. the municipality or the state government. Um, so we could be housed in all those different places. They're probably going to have a fun name like Hello West Michigan, Hello Cincy, Live and Work uh, in Maine is that's what theirs is called. Um, uh, Living Color Utah, right? Like so, everyone has kind of their different thing, but talent attraction um, is typically where you're going to find it. You could also search like relocating to blank city. Um, you could also look mm -hmm. for that too. Um, move to blank mm -hmm. city. Um, that's, that's usually how you can find them. Um, and hopefully they'll, you know, be high up in the search results. But to, a lot of times um, they're kind of nestled under, it might be a program or initiative nestled under an economic developer, a chamber, a municipality, or a convention and visitors bureau. Thank you. That is super helpful. Um, so as we move to a new area, um, whether that's a country, right, Nate, or state, um, what local resources can we look to for support in the transition? Um, what are some things that we can do once moving to help us settle in or feel comfortable in our new area? Yeah, that, that question is really important because once you are doing that move and you're trying to establish roots somewhere, it can be difficult. And I'll say it was nice at the beginning when I moved to Ecuador through the Peace Corps because the United States government really programmed all of that. However, after you get there, it's up to you to really understand your community and get involved and invested. And so uh, with anywhere, I would say go to the vis visitor center. So if there's some type of visitor center, go check in, see what kind of resources they have uh, and just start going around, you know, get get into that town, that city, that space and start to meet locals. And if, if you know no one, then that's a great opportunity for you to utilize your hobbies. So let's say uh, you really like playing tabletop board games or something, go to a gaming cafe and start meeting people there. Let's say you really like dancing, Go to a, a, a dance uh, club or, or a dance studio and maybe learn salsa or um, ballroom or something. Maybe you really like pottery. Go to a pottery studio and start to meet people. Maybe you just like to eat. Go to some restaurants and, and try the local cuisine and, and get uh, feedback from people. Just start to develop connections with folks and see uh, what happens. There's built-in communities as well, like Rot rotary clubs, that's one way you could do um, a connection. Uh, if you're religious, going to some type of um, church or mosque or something like that. Uh, so getting invested in different ways that are meaningful to you. So I let my hobbies really guide me. So when I was uh, in Ecuador, uh, I played saxophone for 15 years. So I went and found a, a local spot that uh, taught music to kids and was able to connect with some people there uh, and just, you know, talk music with people. And music is a whole other language and Ecuador has its own set of languages, Spanish and uh, indigenous languages. So uh, there were a lot of barriers to, to cross when I went there. And so I was able to do that by finding people uh, who shared common interests that I was, was looking for. Um, I would also say, make sure that you have some support network 
network set up. So people who are back home where you were coming from, make sure you're utilizing technology. So Zoom, phone call, text, just keep in touch with people, check in because sometimes you can get a little lost and maybe there's a shift in your identity when you move to a new place. And so making sure you have someone who kind of grounds you and reminds you like, hey, this is why you went out there and I'm so glad to see that you you did it and, and I wanna support you on that journey. So keep in touch with those folks in whatever way that makes sense to you. Um, I think I'll leave it there for the moment. Rachel, do you have anything to add? Absolutely. Everything that Nate said, for sure. I think, you know, as you're thinking about a place to move, whatever research you can do ahead of time, not just about the people or the connections or the jobs that are there, but the community itself, right? Anything you can do before you get there is really important, especially if you have this idea in your mind of like, oh, I heard this place is really cool. I really want to go there. But maybe you're hearing that from, from social media. You're not actually hearing that from people who live there. It's really important that you go check it out first. Um, either go or like do a ton of research. Because here's the thing, every community that's trying to get people to move there is going to say, our city is a great place to live, work and play. That's, that's what all of them are going to say. And so, but what comes after that? Like, what are the places you can go play your saxophone? What are the places that you can go, um, you know, play tabletop games if, that, if that's what you like to do? Um, always make sure like live, work and play is like this very kind of overarching language that's used in my industry. Um, but you always have to make sure they back it up. So like that research is really important. And then once you make the decision, yes, I'm going to go there, it's going to be work like it, like finding new friends and new people and establishing a new network. If you're not moving to a place where family is or friends already are, it's going to be work. And, um, you know, think about all of the things that Nate just, just ticked off. Those are probably things that he's done is my guess, right? Like that's why he just named them. Think about that as, so, okay, you just worked all day at your job and now you come home from work. Then like, if you were to go to all of those places regularly, he just named off like five things. That's all your five weeknights. Um, you're not going to sit at home and Netflix and chill because if you do, like that's all you're going to do and you're going to feel really, really isolated. So it's really important that you understand that, hey, making friends is going to be work. I have to put in effort. I have to put in emotional labor. I have to go out and do these things and try these things. And also understand that you might get rejected, right? Like making friends is not easy. It is not like it is in college where you are seeing people repeatedly in classes or at your student organizations or, you know, at team practice, if you're an athlete, those things, that's where friendships form because you're seeing people repeatedly. That's actually the science of friend finding is repeated, spontaneous interaction. And as you become an adult, that becomes a lot harder. So all the things that Nate just, just listed off, think about what makes sense for you, your hobbies, your interests, but then also look to see, are there opportunities where you can do that repeatedly, right? Where you can go do that every single week. So whether that's a sports league or he mentioned music lessons, right? Music lessons, you're like, you don't just go once, you're going, you're going multiple times. Um, and that repeated part, that's how you start to make friendships and connections. So once you get to a new place, um, it's a lot of work to feel like you live there. It's a lot of work to kind of gather your people around you and start to feel like you have this network. Um, and I will say the other thing, this is actually really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting kind of observation that we get about West Michigan all the time. Because in West Michigan, there's a lot of people who grew up here and stayed here. They're rooted here. There's, there's definitely people who move here, but there's not as many. You go to a place like Chicago or Austin, and um, there's actually a joke in Austin um, that if you find a born and bred Austinite, they're called a unicorn because they're pretty rare. Everyone that's there is moving there. Well, that means that they're more open to having those conversations and, and meeting new people. But if you move to a place where that's not the situation, right, like where people are, are raised and rooted there, they might be a little less open to outsiders um, and making those connections with you. And so that also becomes like a hurdle you have to overcome. Put some work into I'll, I'll jump uh, in, in and add some things to that too. So when I moved up to Houghton, Michigan, as all of you can probably imagine up in the UP, that's not really a space where many people are moving and a lot of the locals are giving a bit of pushback um, when, when people move up there and, and they're like, why would you move here? And so uh, it's gorgeous up there, don't get me wrong. It's beautiful. The, the locals are wonderful people, but a lot of them, aren't as quick to invite you into their homes and to create friendships because they're a little wary on why did you move up here? And they also see, for example, the students at Michigan Tech, they come for four years and then they leave. 
So they're not as quick to craft those friendships when they know they may not be invested in over time. Um, whereas the opposite is in Chicago. Now I live in Chicago and I could literally step out my door and go to any place and, and meet some new folks who probably aren't from Chicago. Uh, and, and we can really get to know each other and, and it's wonderful. So uh, not to say that small town living is a, a bad thing. I think it's a beautiful thing, but know what you're looking for. And if you're somebody who wants to go live in the big city, awesome. Uh, you utilize those as maybe your target points. If you're someone who wants to live in a smaller town or somewhere that's a little sleepy or maybe more focused on like agriculture or just activities that would be further outside of a metropolitan area, uh, make sure that's kind of your guiding star when you are looking for areas to live. Um, another great resource is Reddit. If you've ever utilized the website Reddit, um, you'll get some honest feedback from people about just about anything on Reddit. Uh, and that includes moving somewhere or just even visiting somewhere. So Reddit is a is a, a great way to to get maybe an unbiased or biased view of of a, a space. So highly recommend just doing some research uh, before um, making uh, too big of a, a plunge somewhere. Thank you for bringing up Reddit. I would have never thought about that. That's a very interesting place to look that I'm sure you do get a lot of information from. Um, my history is that I moved to Ludington post-college, so I kind of can sympathize with that small town up north um, local feel, right? And I would say just be patient with yourself. Building new relationships, getting acclimated to a new area all takes time. So just give yourself time and um, trust in the process. Um, also something I don't think was mentioned, but I'm sure was not overlooked is um, volunteering. Volunteering um, for an organization is a great way to meet people because you're bonding over a shared mission or interest. So um, I would absolutely recommend that if you are in a new area and it's also fulfilling in a different way as well. So, um, so we've talked a little bit about when we move to the area, how to get acclimated, how to understand where we're going. Um, let's jump back a bit to the interview process. And as we, um, are asked, are we open to relocation, right? So in an interview where um, relocation is on the table or for a position out of country or state, what are questions that um, I should be sure to ask in the interview process? Well, first off, I mean, you know, is there uh, is there a budget for relocation, right? Like, are, are they gonna support you in that relocation monetarily? Um, that's, I think, always always a big one. And that's going to be a pretty cut and dry answer. They're either going to say, yes, yes, we have budget. There's going to be a package for you. Or they're going to say, no, this is, you know, this is a position that we do not have a relocation budget for. Um, but that's always kind of the first, first place to start. Um, and again, you have to decide, um, do you want to go to this place badly enough that you can self-fund a move? Uh, moving is not cheap. Now, it may seem easier, especially when you're a college student, because you may not be waylaid with with so many physical items. Um, but, you know, like Julie, for you, I would imagine, right, like there, there's a house there. There's a lot more riding on that. Um, and so, you know, moving moving is not cheap. Um, you can't uh, just get your friends and especially when you're going like not just across town. If you're if you're moving out of state, you can't just, uh, you know, call your friends with a truck and give them a case of beer when they're and pizza when they're done. Um, it's going to cost money. So you really, like find out what that is um, because you need to be really clear. Like, can you, can you afford that? Um, so that would be like the first question. And then, um, I mean, a couple others are like, what are their support resources? Um, how soon did they want you to be there? Um, right. You know, for a lot of companies, especially if they don't have a relocation package, if, right, if they're not expecting to get someone out of state, they may think like, okay, we're going to fill this role and the, that person will be here in kind of the standard two weeks. If you're moving, even if, if you're, you know, one of the college students, new grads moving, you may not be able to get there in two weeks. Um, and so, you know, those are definitely two, two biggies that I would ask, you know, right, right away as you start applying. So uh, I, I'll follow up on that with a personal story. Uh, when I started working at DePaul, I was moving from Houghton down to Chicago, again, like six and a half hour uh, drive. And I was moving quite a bit of stuff. Um, I was, I'm, wasn't a, an entry-level employee anymore. 
Uh, I moved from like a three bedroom apartment up in Houghton because I had a ton of space up there for cheap uh, to Chicago. And I had to condense everything to two car loads. And so that, that was really difficult. And uh, DePaul was really understanding and said, okay, we're going to have you start remote and then you can come in person um, like a month later, which was nice. So I was able to move work remote across that time period. I was able to negotiate that because they weren't going to give me a relocation um, stipend. They, they unfortunately didn't have that available. And I'll say a lot of uh, STEM areas probably will give you a relocation package, whereas maybe humanities and arts and things like that don't often uh, in education don't often give a relocation stipend. So just just be wary of that. Um, two questions that I wrote down that I thought uh, would be good to ask for all of you is how have others transitioned uh, when working here from out of state? So ask them if there's some people there who are from out of state and how was their transition? And uh, if they don't immediately know in the interview, maybe they can connect you with that person uh, so you can talk with them and hear uh, what their transition was like. Um, also, what, what local resources are available to newcomers? What recommendations do you have when, when moving somewhere? Uh, some companies do have like housing assistance. That's pretty rare, but it is an option. So if you uh, need that, maybe ask and see if they have any recommendations, even of places like that are, are maybe a little uh, cheaper to live locally to where that workplace is. Um, so just see what, what recommendations they have about local resources. Um, and then also there's a thing called affinity groups a lot of times in workplaces. So let's say you have an identity that you hold and you want to get to know folks who share that identity. For example, um, there are sometimes affinity groups for um, women, uh, people who identify as queer, people with disabilities, uh, et cetera. So any of those uh, different identities, there may be an affinity group at the place you're going to potentially work for. Um, so ask about those and see if they're active. And um, for example, at DePaul, we have a ton of them and uh, all of them participate in a lot of different events throughout Chicago. Um, so that's something that allows me to get connected with the Chicago community um, just through uh, some identities that I hold, which is great. So. Um, I I would recommend checking out that as as one of your possibilities when you're going into this. Anytime that you can talk to someone who's not the recruiter um, or like not the me in that community, right? Like I'm gonna probably give you the best version of the community, but and the the recruiter who's trying to sell you on the job, they're gonna try to give you the best version of of the community as well. But like Nate said, if you can talk to someone who's made that relocation. Um, or, you know, find that feedback on Reddit, you're gonna, you're gonna find some unfiltered um, and like the real feedback. So I think that's a great suggestion is asking, you know, asking their recruiter, anyone at your company who's done it that I can talk to and have that conversation separately, because that's when you're going to get the real, the real feedback. Also, I encourage you to use, utilize uh, the Alumni Relations Office at Grand Valley. That's, of course, a shameless plug, but we also have affinity groups, which are all over the country. And so by reaching out to us, we are able to connect you with those groups. Um, our networks, we call them, are um, based on either region, so um, areas with a large accumulation of alumni have typically regional networks and then conversely based on affinity, which are all over. So um, those are both two areas that you could tap into, right? You could be a member of the, um, let's say, film and video affinity network and also of the Chicago area affinity network. So those are different groups of people um, depending on the place and your interests. Um, I will jump into another question here, um, cost of living. So you have received an offer, you are interested in relocating, you have done your research in the area. Do you have any advice for determining, um, cost of living? We know that this varies greatly from state to state and what resources are available to determine what a fair salary range might be and take this into consideration. Nate, you've lived in some places with probably vastly different cost of living. How did, how did you go about it? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I've I've lived in you know I lived in Ecuador. I was making under five hundred dollars a month U.S. dollars, and then um, Houghton was a little bit cheaper than than Chicago. Chicago being the most expensive place I've lived yet. Um, cost of living is a real thing, and I would say it's something you really need to identify uh, before moving because you don't want to be caught in a space where you're paying a lot more money than you realized you were going to be. So for example, San Francisco is probably one of the most expensive places to live in the entire United States. Uh, maybe don't move to San Francisco if you're you're looking to work um, a quiet nine to five job um, at, a, at a, a modest wage, uh, because you'll probably be living with three other people in a one bedroom apartment. Uh, so that's just something to consider. Um, and it, it is a reality for people. And so uh, for me, when I was uh, looking to move from Houghton to a larger city, I, I was looking at a lot of different cities. It wasn't just Chicago. Um, I was looking at uh, Milwaukee. I was looking at uh, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Chicago, Detroit. I was looking across all these larger cities in the Midwest um, so I could stay close to my family in Grand Rapids. Um, and so for me, I was using a cost of living calculator online. And there's a lot of different resources online to look up cost of living. Uh, I, I can't recommend just one because there's hundreds of them on the computer. But I would take a look at those and see what is the average cost of living for someone. And not only that, but what is a living wage in the area that you're going to be moving to? Uh, Chicago, one of the numbers that was given on the calculator was 51000 is a living wage in Chicago. and that's more than some people make uh, or, or than a lot of people make. Um, so recognize that if you're going to be um, accepting a position at 51,000, you're going to be you know, at, a, at a mark that you may be needing to be really frugal with your money. You'll probably need to live with roommates. I'll say when I first moved to Chicago, I was living with three other guys in an apartment and uh, was able to, to live that way to make ends meet. And it was awesome. I mean, I'll, I'll admit, um, met some really great friends. They're wonderful people. They helped me kind of establish my network here. So I guess that's another tip is if you don't know anyone in the area, potentially find roommates. And uh, I, I did some like Zoom interviews with them before I moved to Chicago and realized like, yeah, these are good people and I, I would be happy to live with them. And during my first year, it was great and I absolutely loved it. Um, so check out the cost of living and, and make sure that you can um, adequately afford to live there. Uh, but I would recommend don't move to a place where you're going to be miserable. You know, there are some places, uh, for example, San Francisco, like I mentioned, that uh, you may not be able to live comfortably and uh, it may be difficult to save. So if you're interested, and I would encourage you to save your money, invest your money, uh, and to look towards the future, uh, you may want to live in a space that's slightly cheaper. Uh, and I would say Chicago's a somewhat affordable city compared to maybe New York or San Francisco. Um, so I, for me, it, it, it made sense. But uh, for each of you, I would say, look online and see what is the cost of living for certain areas and uh, see if there's people who are there that, that you would enjoy being with. All of that, absolutely. Um, you know, what, what's really interesting is I think, uh, especially here in Michigan, what, what you have to understand is in West Michigan, we have a very low cost of living. So if a, if a hundred, one zero zero is the national average, um, Grand Rapids is only at about ninety two or ninety three. So that's very much below the national average, right? And that's the average. A place like San Francisco, that number is like a hundred and twenty three. Um, and you can find this data at holy org. Um, that's actually like this is the data that we cite in like on our website um, and uh, on our partners' website. That's the right place. Um, this is where we cite the, the cost of living data. Because if you go start looking at jobs first and if the wages are listed, you're like, oh my gosh, this salary, I could make so much more in San Francisco than I could for the same job in, in Grand Rapids. You are not comparing apples to apples. You are, this is totally apples to oranges when you think about the cost of living. Um, and so really do some research about that cost of living even before you get to the job piece. Um, Cause, and, and just kind of understand that in these tier one cities and the larger cities, cost of living is gonna be higher. Um, it, it's definitely going to be higher. Can you get the same level of amenities in um, a tier two city as you can in tier one, but without that cost of living surcharge, right? Like that's, that's what you want to think about when, um, when you're, uh, when you're researching. 
and think about too, like what, like, what do you want to do? What do you like to do? Um, if you want to be out of the bars and the nightlife, always have people hustling and bustling around you. Okay, cool. Then, then go look in a larger city. But if that's not you, like if you really are a homebody, um, you have to be very, very true to yourself and very real about like, maybe this is the image I want. Like, this is my ideal life of what I think I want, but then this is what I actually do. And those two things may not be the same. So even though it may sound cool to live in a big city, if like you are not like truly going out and doing that all the time, then it makes no sense to pay to move there. Just, you know, even if it, if it looks cool or sounds cool. So you have to be really real with yourself on like, what are you willing to do? Um, that's, you know, that's a big part about picking the city. And so the cost of living is massive in that. Also thinking about too, you know, is um, what is that? There's also, so there's cost of living calculator, but then there's also salary calculators. Um, so look at your cost of living, but then also look at what, you know, for what I do, how are people paid in that area? Um, and that's, that one's kind of like a little bit more squidgy because they're like, while the cost of living might be higher, there also may be a huge concentration of the type of, um, of candidate that you are, right? So like in San Francisco, I know we keep coming back to that. Um, they have a higher cost of living. Well, they also have tons of software developers there. So like, if that's, if that's what you do, and you go there, then you're one of many. But if you're a software developer and you go to, you know, uh, a place that's looking for software developers, you're one of a few. And now you can command a higher wage. So those are things that you really have to start to look at. But um, with cost of living, man, that one's like, that one's really eye-opening because people will see, oh my gosh, these salaries, they look so big and so great, but they, they're not understanding the cost of living. Um, and in West Michigan, it's really hard because we are on the, uh, the lower end. So what you are used to paying in rent, utilities, clothes, coffee, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, all those things, so it's a lot different in those big cities. I'll add quick as well. Taxes are different in each state. So be aware when you're moving somewhere, the tax taxation may look different. So um, Chicago's taxes are higher than West Michigan's, uh, and that's just a reality. Um, and there are a lot more amenities, honestly, in Chicago. The public transportation is wonderful here. Uh, I don't drive to work. I'm able to take a train, essentially a, a bus, a train, whatever, from my doorstep to where I work, and I can sit down, read a book, listen to music. It's lovely. I don't have to drive anymore, which I, I didn't love having to drive everywhere. Um, so just just be aware of, of those types of things um, when you're, you're going into this. But taxes, uh, definitely keep that in mind when you move somewhere because taxation is different in every single city, state, et cetera. Great advice. So we have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure we leave time for each of you to ask any burning questions you have. I do have one question left, which I am sure Julie is interested in. So um, I will go ahead and ask that and then feel free to pop it or pipe in or um, if you have anything you want answered specific to that, Julie. Um, I received a job offer in which I will be expected to relocate, my partner will need to find a position when I move. R what resources are available to us? Ask the same questions you'd ask for yourself. Um, and this, this is hard because um, a recruiter can't ask you if you have a spouse or a partner that's relocating with you. They can't, they can't ask that, that's an illegal question. If you offer up the information, then they can they can start to offer things. And hopefully, if you're working with a good recruiter, they should be able to offer that. But think about the things that are most important to you or maybe your family when you're relocating. Almost all of those are legal questions. And so you really have to be willing to put yourself out there and say, okay, these are the questions that I have. You know, what are you going to disclose? But all the things for your partner, right? Like those, you're going to have to ask um, all the things you ask for yourself. You're going to have to ask for your partner as well. Um, and some places, like if you start looking at a smaller town, if you're looking at like an anchor employer in a smaller town, they're actually probably pretty used to this question, um, right? Like it's actually pretty common for large employers to say, all right, if like this is the candidate we really want, um, we need to find a job for their spouse as well. But again, that's different, right? Like that's if you're being actively recruited. Um, if you're not being actively recruited, if you're self-funding this, this relocation, they're, they're maybe not willing to open up a, a role for you. Um, so like, that's like, that's something that you kind of have to have to balance. 
I would also say, make sure you've had that conversation with your partner about what if you get a position, you move and they're still looking, you know, that's, that's a reality for some people. And maybe that looks like uh, one of the partners is, is taking care of the house, or if you have children or, uh, you know, pets or plants, whatever that is, um, they would, would potentially be the person who's taking care of that for a little while. Um, so are they okay with that? So I, I would make sure to, to chat with them about what does that look like? And when you're deciding a place to move, make sure that there's work for them in that area. If you're moving to a space where their uh, degree or their talents are not utilized or not needed, um, just be aware of that because you, you don't want to move somewhere where it's good for you, but your partner's like, I want to work and I can't find anything. So just think about that. Chat with your partner. Make sure you're you're able to come to a decision that makes sense together. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna open the floor. Jenna, Julie, or Shane, do you have any questions or comments you would like to make um, before we wrap up here tonight? Um, this isn't. It's sort of on the topic, but uh, regarding the career fair tomorrow, um, Shane is going um, and he's in the STEM field. He's a physics major. I know there's, I mean, physics is a broad, a very broad chain. You can chime in anytime, but um, how many employers typically, I mean, are there, you know, for that type of career? I'm not sure if you're familiar with you know, how I am not incredibly familiar just because I am new to being back at the university. Okay. So tomorrow will be my first career fair, but I do know that they do list the employers attending yeah. on their website. Yeah, I saw um, that. Yes. Yeah, so saw I can, that. you did see it. I yeah. Saw, I can mm -hmm. pop the link in there, but if you saw it, I would encourage you to um, look at that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if anything, it's, it's yeah. just a good experience, you know, for him to go oh, and yeah, talk to people and, talk and, and to you know people. just yeah just yeah just for yeah, the experience itself it. so go ahead Shane uh, I'm looking forward to it good awesome. there's um there's usually uh anywhere between like 230 and 250 employers there um definitely take a look uh ahead of time mm -hmm. um and do uh, do a little bit of research make yourself a um a list of hey you know these are companies that sound interesting that I want to go talk to um, and then actually one of the things that's probably going to be most helpful is note what booth number they're in um, because the they're not in alphabetical order when they're there. They're, it, it's, they kind of have a, a way of mapping them out, um, but it's a big room. So it's going to feel overwhelming when you walk in there. Um, I probably won't be there tomorrow because um, I'm a little bit under the weather, but my, uh, my, pro, my, my team member, Jessica, will be there. She'll be walking around. Um, it can feel really overwhelming while you're there. So take a look at, make a list of companies that you want to talk to um, that sound interesting um, and make a note of their booth number so you can find them a little bit easier because um, the booth numbers are in order, but like the companies are not in alphabetical order. So do that. Um, and then they should have sheets as well. Some of them fill out. Um, they literally will fill out a sheet like handwritten on their on their table that says these are the um, the majors that we're hiring for or the fields. Um, so be on the lookout mm. for those two, right? Like there's going to be a lot to look at in there. They all have big displays. They have, you know, promotional items on their tables. They have lots of stuff. People are going to be trying to talk to you, which is great. Um, but be on the lookout for, um, for, for like those handwritten sheets as well. And it may be posted on the website, but do yourself a favor, do some research tonight um, so that you have a plan of attack when you walk in there. Thank you think, for filling in those gaps for me. <laughs> I think too, um, if they're still utilizing Handshake, which I believe they are, um, you can look on Handshake and see which majors they're willing to meet with and which positions they're hiring for. Uh, so that's another way to preemptively look and you can filter through Handshake and see that information. Uh, and I, I believe they still use Handshake. Yes. Yeah. Any additional questions or comments before we wrap up here tonight? So I actually want to ask Jenna, where are you looking to go? Where What's next? I worked at Michigan Tech, which is a huge mechanical engineering school. Um, where where do you want to work if you got had a choice? This is bad. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's OK. I know I want to leave Michigan, but that's so broad. I have 
what kind of has inspired me because like freshman year I was like I'm gonna work where I co-op and I'm gonna be there forever like I don't want to leave I just want to work at the same spot but my roommates are going to like do their PhD out of state you know they've been applying to colleges and it's kind of like inspired me a little bit so I'm a little nervous about moving alone than not knowing anyone because my whole family lives in Michigan so I've kind of been looking where my roommates are looking for their PhD program so uh -huh. like North Carolina like Chicago area is kind of like the top ones right now so I'm kind of looking in those areas but I don't know what I want to do sure it's so yeah. bad have you traveled yeah. anywhere that you like I've been to North Carolina before and I've liked that I also have liked Arizona but I wouldn't want to live there in the summer <laughs> But um, I think I'm not feeling pressed for time because I can't start till September, but that's kind of like a bad outlook. But I'm like, I can't look too early because a lot of people who are looking for like entry level positions are looking for like May start. And I feel like I can't, I feel like I can't apply for those. I know that might be like in my head more, but I feel like I can't, I mean, on my resume, it would say like September start, but I don't know how, I don't know how that works. I it, my industry must, might be different than yours, but I would say don't underestimate how long the hiring process and relocation process takes because it is a lengthy process. And so um, it might take longer than you think. And they might be looking at a candidate that's a little further out. Okay, that's yeah. a good tip. Thank you. I, I would agree. I would say it's never too early to start talking with people. Again, build that network, have those conversations. And you might be the one person where people say, oh my gosh, we need a mechanical engineer. One of our uh, students or one of our candidates dropped out. We're about to hit September. Where's Jenna? Like, where was the person who could start in September? So get your name out there, be present with everybody and just um, let them know, hey, I'm, I'm not going to be available till September, but I'm excited to work in, in this area. I really like your company. Here's the research I've done. And once you've started to make those connections, recruiters talk. Uh, I've been in, around enough career fairs to know sometimes recruiters will get together afterward and get drinks and just start chatting about, okay, this student was fantastic, but unfortunately, we're already filled for this quarter. So you should definitely hire this person. And there's a lot of conversations that happen outside of a career fair uh, between, between recruiters. And a lot of recruiters actually shift around to different companies. So they may be saying, well, I used to work for Herman Miller, and I think Jenna would be a great fit for Herman Miller. So you should absolutely uh, take a look at her resume. Here you go. Um, so highly recommend looking. Um, another state you might want to consider too is Wisconsin. It's not too far from home. There are a ton of mechanical engineering positions in Wisconsin um, and a fun state to live in too. You could you know, live up by Green Bay, you could live in Madison, Milwaukee um, and still be very close to home. So uh, I, I have I, looked at around Madison. One of my roommates has gotten into their program. So she, oh, just, she just went there last weekend uh, for a visit, but Good. it does look really nice there. It's lovely. I, I love Madison, one of my favorite cities to, when I want to get out of Chicago and go to a smaller city, I usually drive up to Madison and stay with some friends up there. <laughs> Thank you. That's all really good help, especially because it's like, I got to start making my future here, right? Oh, yeah. I'm so nervous. So. <laughs> you're going to do great. And if you're struggling, talk to the Career Center, talk to Alumni Relations, and just start chatting with people. I think that's my biggest takeaway for everyone here is ask questions. Just start asking questions. It doesn't matter what the question is. Just start talking to people and see what comes of it. Right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nate and Rachel, um, for helping us out as panelists tonight. And Jenna, Julie, and Shane, thank you so much for your conversation and your um, active engagement and pivoting at the last minute. We really appreciate it. Um, that will conclude our programming for tonight. Um, I do just want to plug that our last installation of the Career Readiness Series will be on March 8th. That will be focused on um, navigating imposter syndrome. So we are looking forward to a great 
program there um, that will be structured a bit differently because it is facilitated by Grand Valley alumni and career coach Amy Pierce Sanders. We are very lucky to have her um, willing to do that for us. She owns or uh, she has her own private practice in which she's a career coach. So a lot of expertise she is bringing us. Um, she is doing more of a workshop style event um, that will happen again on March 8th. So I encourage you to join us. I encourage you to call on the Alumni Relations Office for any additional career-related support and also the Career Center. Um, both of those are resources to you as a Laker for a lifetime. So thank you again, Nate and Rachel, and thanks for joining us. Thank you.